Welcome to CB8 Speaks. My name is David Liston. I am a former chair of Manhattan Community Board 8. I currently serve as co-chair of the Health, Seniors, and Social Services Committee. And I am so very pleased to host this episode of CB8 Speaks. Tonight, we are focused on a very important issue, and the issue is domestic violence. This is an issue that, of course, affects our entire nation, our entire city, and very much affects the very community that this board represents, the Upper East Side of Manhattan. I am so happy and honored to have on the show this evening uh, Executive Assistant District Attorney Audrey Moore with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. And I don't want to spend, up, spend our entire episode <laughs> on your background, but I do think our viewers should know a little bit about you um, and why we're so honored to have you with us. Uh, ADA Audrey Moore has been with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office for over 25 years. Uh, she currently serves as Chief of the Special Victims Bureau of the DA's Office. That unit oversees the management of the Child Abuse Unit, the Domestic Violence Unit, the Elder Abuse Unit, the Human Trafficking Program, and the Witness Aid Services Unit. Uh, in addition to those responsibilities, ADA Moore also oversees the District Attorney's Northern Manhattan Office. Among other honors for her public service, ADA Moore has been honored by the New York City Bar Association, which presented to her the Thomas E. Dewey Award, which is an award given to an assistant DA each year in each of the DA's offices in the city in recognition of their outstanding contributions as prosecutors. She's also been honored by, being received, by receiving the New York County Lawyers Association Public Service Award. Uh, ADA Moore, thank you so very much for joining us on the show. And thank you so much for having this conversation about domestic violence. Well, we're glad to, to do that. In fact, before we go any further, I should mention you were kind enough to give me this yes. pin, which I'm so happy to wear. Can you tell us a little bit about this pin? Right, so the pin just represents domestic violence, and as you see, I'm in a little bit of purple as well, and purple is the color of domestic violence, and during the month of October, um, we ask people to wear the pin to bring awareness of domestic violence to the community. So if you see someone say, oh, you got that pin, you know, I'm aware that domestic violence exists and it's a problem. Good. Would you tell us a little bit about the Special Victims Bureau generally and also your role within the Bureau? Right. So when D.A. Vance took over, he decided that he, we should bring all of the cases with vulnerable victims together under one bureau. And because so many times when you see child abuse, there's domestic violence in the home. Uh, many of our sex abuse cases can also be domestic violence. Um, he thought there should be one bureau. So this um, Special Victims Bureau is comprised of sex crimes, domestic violence, child abuse, human trafficking, and elder abuse. And what we really try to do is to examine all of those cases, but we don't look under just one lens. We kind of look under the lens of Special Victims Bureau. So for example, many times now when we look at um, cases, for example, for prostitution, um, those, or cases I should say that come in as domestic violence, those cases sometimes actually turn out to be human trafficking. You know, I they're see. actually, it's not really a boyfriend, girlfriend, it's actually someone who is forcing someone to sell themselves. And we've actually developed human trafficking cases that started out as domestic violence cases. So it makes a lot of sense that you would have each of these topics covered by the same unit. Right, and having all of that leadership and expertise together. And when we, you know, you and I have used the term domestic violence a few times tonight. How do you define that term? Or right. how, do, how does the DA's office define it? So we define domestic violence partly it has to do with um, the relationship and domestic violence is really when someone is exerting p power and control over another person and it's usually in an intimate partner relationship or it can be about family. So in order for in our office to be considered domestic violence it has to be either related by blood, um, related by marriage, or people who are dating together. And the definition actually was expanded um, because in the past it used to be a lot narrower and it only were people who were living together. So therefore people who were dating together, um, uh, people who weren't married, weren't covered. Now the definition is broad enough that if you're dating, 
it could be considered domestic violence. If you're in a same-sex relationship, it could be considered domestic violence. And it's really, domestic violence is not just about someone punching you. You know, the first thought is always the black eye. Mm -hmm. It's not just the black eye. Physical abuse is obviously the one that comes to mind first and foremost. But the emotional abuse, the physical abuse, you know, continuously being told um, that you're nothing, um, being threatened, um, sexual assault. People don't necessarily think that someone, if you're married, you can be raped. That's absolutely not true. Um, we do have cases where we have intimate partner sexual assault, um, financial abuse, people not even, um, someone taking control of all of your finances. Um, we talk to women who don't have a bank card, who are given you know, $10 a week to survive. Um, they have no ability um, to control their money or any money whatsoever and in some instances we even have identity theft or people opening up credit cards and um, their partner's name and then destroying their credit mm. and leaving that person with the debt so it's a spectrum of things and I guess what you know the message first and foremost is you know don't think about it very narrowly it can be so many things I see and, and your office uh, has really been at the forefront of coming up with ways to investigate and prosecute domestic violence and to provide services to the victims of domestic violence. Can you tell us a little bit about the various services that your office provides, whether directly or uh, in conjunction with other agencies and organizations? Initially, I think when people think about prosecutors' offices, it becomes all about um, someone wanting to throw someone in jail or prosecute someone. And what we realized, um, and I would say this is starting with Morgenthau probably about 35, uh, 40 years ago, that we needed to have a unit that addressed served crime victims. Um, so we have what is called the Witness Aid Service Unit. And the Witness Aid Service Unit is comprised of advocates, you know, people who will help people navigate um, the criminal justice system if they have questions. Um, we have social service workers who will sit there and figure out what do I need to help this person move on. So in domestic violence that's so key because sometimes it might be having your lock changed, it might be helping you find shelter, you know, it might be giving you a phone. You know, sometimes people don't have phone. It, it might be figuring out, let me figure out what services you're e even eligible for with the city. Let me be an advocate and try to help you move forward. Um, particularly in the field of domestic violence, um, the reason why so many people sometimes end up staying is because they don't feel like they can move. They don't feel like they can leave the person who's supporting them. And so we kind of look at what can we do to help a person move forward and to let them know we're not al there alone and that we can support them. Um, so those, those are some of the things. And we also have um, counselors who will also kind of help people with kind of dealing with testifying you know at trial or being prepared for trial or working on a victim impact statement to read to judge these are all things that you know the criminal justice system can be so daunting so you really have to have someone can help someone navigate the system and while the assistant district attorney um, it's great that we you know can focus on the prosecution it's nice to be able to have a team of people that we can turn a victim over to who will support them I see um, I served as an assistant DA at the Manhattan DA's office lo longer ago than I <laughs> care to admit on television or, or anywhere. But I remember that um, I had the opportunity to prosecute domestic violence cases. And I remember that those cases presented some unique challenges. And I imagine they still do. Can you tell us a little bit about what makes prosecuting and investigating a domestic violence case uh, more challenging or, or differently challenging than other sorts of cases? Well, like many crime, um, it's not always taking place um, in, pro in public. So these are things that happen in private. And in many instances, you really have to rely upon um, you know what a victim is telling you in order to go forward with the case. Now, having said that, um, domestic violence cases, while people want the violence to stop or the situation to stop, they're not always, um, don't always want to be particularly engaged in the criminal justice process. Um, and, and for many reasons, um, you know, victims are afraid of what's going to happen to them because at a certain point, the DA's office you know, is going to go about their business. The police are not always there, so sometimes they're afraid that nobody can protect me, you mm -hmm. know, from my batterer. I think that sometimes um, they don't always have the support of various communities or families. You know, I've heard from victims that, you know, people will say if he is providing well 
for my for your family, then you know you put up with it. You know, it can be the father of your child. Mm -hmm. You know that you know this is someone who's the father of my child. And I should just stop for a moment because I'm saying she as the victim, but I do acknowledge that we do have men that are victims of domestic violence. Um, but it's still overwhelmingly the victims right now that we deal with in our office are are female. Okay. Um, but you know there are just so many reasons, and this just also some people are embarrassed and ashamed mm. um, to be a, you know a victim you know of a crime and a victim of domestic violence. Like they think that they have done something um, to deserve this, or they think that people are going to judge them. Um, so we have to deal with when people come in, all of this is going on, and they don't always necessarily you know want to be part of the prosecution. They just mm -hmm. want the incident to stop. So one, we work very closely, as I said, with, you know, our witness aid service unit. And I didn't even talk about, you know, the other partnerships we have. You know, we now sit in the Family Justice Center, um, the Special Victims Bureau. Oh, yeah. One side is, um, as we say, the law enforcement side. The other side is an entire civil side that has um, civil attorneys. So for example, maybe there are children involved and they need to go to family court. Um, to come up with child support or visitation schedules or maybe they need a divorce, there are attorneys who can help them with that. Immigration, you know, domestic violence happens to everyone and many instances people will have immigration concerns, mm -hmm. you know, the batter will threaten that I'm going to have you deported. Well, guess what, if you're a victim of domestic violence and you have a criminal court case and you're cooperating with us, you know, we can, you know, fill out a certification that states that this person is cooperating that helps them eventually stay in the country legally. Um, but you need, an, you know, it's, it's helpful to have an attorney to do that. And the civil side has attorneys. They have counseling for children. They have counseling for the, you know, for the victims. They have counseling for them together. They have support groups. They have self-sufficiency because we talked a little bit about, you know, sometimes people not having resources. Well, what does a person need to do to be able to, you know, move forward and get a job? You know, helping people develop skills, helping people put a resume together and really kind of looking at of a holistic, multidisciplinary approach to that victim. And um, that's one of the things that I think our office is proudest of is our collaborations and our relationships with not just our office, because we all can't do it alone, but with all of these um, different agencies. And we work with so many um, wonderful community-based agencies all over the city. That's great. That's great. When we, um, when we talk about victims of domestic violence, I think there is a, a perception, probably a misconception, that domestic violence is a problem unique to a particular group of people from a particular socioeconomic background and otherwise is not a prevalent issue throughout society. Can you tell us, you know, is there a typical victim of domestic violence? Is there a typical uh, batterer in domestic violence? No, um, it would nice to be able to say that everybody walks with a sign as to who they mm -hmm. are. Um, but the reality is, is domestic violence happens in every single, as I say, it happens in every race, every religion, every sexual orientation. It happens in L the LGBT community. Um, it happens in every socioeconomic group. Um, it happens everywhere. I can tell you that probably right now, somewhere in, somewhere in community board eight, someone is probably a victim right now of domestic violence. Um, there are just so many reasons why people don't report. And I do think that, you know, being embarrassed and being uh, you know, afraid to, like, what's going to happen is one of them, but it is everywhere. And I'm so glad that you asked that question because we just time and time again want the message to get out there. You know, you're not alone and you're not alone in it happening to you. It happens everywhere, even though that's not always the messaging that we get. I see. When you think about victims of domestic violence and their decision about whether to approach law enforcement, w what do you anticipate are the, the, the concerns they have and how does your office try to address those concerns? Well, I think there are a lot of misconceptions sometimes, you know, that, oh, if I have children, they're going to end up taking my children away, you know, you know, I've heard that, that people are not going to be supportive, you know, that law enforcement is not going to be supportive, that no one is going to believe me. And I think that 
what becomes so important is all of the partnerships um, that we have. And we have actually a great relationship with NYPD. For example, in the Family Justice Center that I was just talking about, there are two domestic violence police officers that sit on our side. So for example, if someone comes to the Family Justice Center, that's a walk-in center. So anybody mm -hmm. could walk in and say, I'm a victim of domestic violence, I need help they then can walk them over to NYPD. And you know they don't necessarily have to go and file a report at a police station. They could actually come to the Family Justice Center. Of course, if someone is in danger, they should always call 911. But I do think the police department has, um, is really working very hard um, to collaborate with people. Um, so people really do know that we're all here to help. And I think that's, to me, continuously has to be the messaging, you know, they'll we'll help you, we'll take you to the Family Justice Center. And, and I, that's part why they're one of our most powerful partners there. What would you say to, the, to a victim of domestic violence who says, I want the abuse to stop, but I don't want the person who's doing it to go to jail? So I think that's another misconception is that everyone who was arrested um, goes to jail. And I'm sure you remember even in sure. your career as a prosecutor that there are people that go to jail and they're, you know, and that is where certain people should go, but that's not the case for many of our cases. Um, there are so many alternatives. Um, for example, there are batterers programs that people are sentenced to a lot. So jail is not our only option, J uh, not at all. Um, we always listen to what a victim wants to have happen. But it sh they shouldn't think that if someone is arrested, the only place they're going to go is jail. I mean, we do do better with programs, and we do all sorts of other programs um, to try to see what we can do. Because many people want to stay together as well. Like, they want the violence to stop, but they also want to stay in this relationship. So it becomes tricky, but we try to sit there and navigate um, an outcome that you know, will hold a batter accountable. Because it's important to hold a, hold a batter accountable um, and get the behavior to stop. Um, but have at the same time have a victim have confidence in the system. I see. Uh, I I if a victim of domestic violence were to say to you, you know, what's this process going to involve? What will you need from me? What should I expect to have happen next? Can you, and I imagine no two cases are alike, but can you give us sort of a general sense of the, of the process? But let's assume um, that there's an assault, the police are called. Um, the batterer is on the scene and arrested. Um, the batterer will then appear in front of a judge. Um, he will be told what he's charged with and an order of protection will be issued. Um, at some point, you know, initially when a case um, is brought, the ADA will meet, um, will meet with the victim to find out what's happened, what went on. Um, and to also see what's going on in their life. And for us, what's really important about that time that we not only find out what's going on in terms of the criminal background and what, how strong our case is, if there are other you know, witnesses, you know, what evidence perhaps there is. Suppose he broke a phone and she comes in with broken phone or suppose um, there are ripped clothing or blo bloody clothing, we can you know, get the evidence. The other yeah. thing that we would um, do is really hook that person up with our witness aid service unit. So we would sit there and say, okay, um, you know, the case is gonna go on, but as you know, the criminal justice uh, system, it can take a little bit long of a time. You know, they'll have to come in and talk to us, and most cases are disposed of without a trial, but if a case did go to trial, perhaps, um, she would have to testify. But the interim, we have to look at what also, you know, can we do for that victim? So we always, you know, part of our protocol is to connect victims with our witness aid service unit, you know, to see, you know, what they need um, and to help them with services and help them move forward. I see. Um, how effective have you found orders of protection to be in protecting victims? You know, as I say, I think our office like issued like something like 30,000 orders of protection wow. last year. I mean, it's a, you know, when you look at them a few times and we don't have 30,000 criminal contempt cases of violating the orders. So I, I mean, I think orders of protection um, can work, but I also think you have to always listen to what a victim tells you in terms of their batterer, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because at the end of the day, right, an order of protection is a piece of paper and if they think a batterer is particularly very dangerous, then it's really important that they come and they talk to someone, be it our witness aid service unit or advocates in the Family Justice Center about safety planning. You know, like what do we need to do to make this person safe? And you know, 
sometimes the odor protection, like I said, most of the time the odor protection is fine and it works. Mm -hmm. um, there are some cases where the odor protection is violated. And when the odor protection is violated, you know, we will go and re-arrest people for violating the odor protection. And, you know, and in many instances really, you know, ask for, you know, for them to stay in jail, um, you know, during that period. So, you know, it kind of depends, but I do think, I do find them useful. Good. I think there might be a perception that domestic violence is caused by anger management issues. Right. Uh, I have a feeling that might be an oversimplification. Can you talk a little bit about that? Right. And, and you hear a lot of time, like, all he needs is an anger management. Right. Um, um, you know, program. And as we say, anger management programs, the problem, you know, a batterers program is very different from an anger management program. You know, a batterers, you know, program is a lot of times talking about the power and control. Because we say the, bat the person who batters, he, he does it to his wife or to, or she does it to her husband or to their partner. They're not doing it at work. You know, they don't do it to other people in other situations. It's, it, it is a choice. You know, anger management is really, you know, more talking about the person who is, um, you know, angry, gets angry, might have a reason for getting angry. So, for example, when you have the road rage, right? If someone mm. cuts in front of you, sure. you have a right to be angry sometimes, sure. right? It, mm -hmm. You might have hit another car. The but anger is justified. It's but, the management that's the issue. <laughs> but does that give you then the right, you know, to, you know, get a gun and go shoot the person who did it to you? No, it's the right. right. So it's all about looking at the way that you deal with your anger, um, which is why anger management, you know, is not the solution in domestic violence cases. It's a different kind of, it's a whole different kind of um, situation where it's all about power and control. It's, it's not about them managing their anger. And by putting a batterer, you know, in an uh, anger management um, program, you could be validating why he gets angry. You know, we've handled cases in our office where someone would get beaten for serving the wrong kind of rice. You know, I want brown rice as opposed to white rice. We don't ever want to be validating that <laughs> that was okay, you know, behavior. Right. Um, so I just think people think the words are interchangeable, but they mean different things. Yeah. Both of them have their places, but not necessarily in domestic violence. I see. Um, we've seen in this city, thankfully, crime go down for a number of years in a number of different ways. What about domestic violence? What's happening? Is it the same? Is it going up? Is it going down? Well, so I would say in the last uh, five years, domestic violence um, kind of crept up. It was really creeping up every year, and in fact, from 2000 and um, last year, it went up almost 20 percent. Um, this year, we actually, it's, it's not up that much. It's, pr it's probably going to be about the same as last year. It might be up maybe 1 percent, mm -hmm. but it wasn't significant. And I would say almost every year it was up anywhere from 6 to 7 percent. Um, so it's interesting. Does that mean that there's more domestic violence? Or does that mean that we're doing a better job mm -hmm. of getting the message that there are people who really want to help? I mean, I just think it's a very different landscape in terms of us shining the light on the problem of domestic violence and telling people there are people here to help you. So some people like, is that's a horrible thing. I actually think it's probably a good thing in a sense yeah. that we have more cases um, because I think more people are feeling more comfortable and supported to report. Um, but you know, you, you read in the newspaper every day, domestic violence, I mean, it's here. and. You know, I would love one day to say that those numbers will, will go down to zero, um, but I tell people it's hard to say what the increase necessarily means. You know, we talk about ways to combat other types of crime, you know, get guns <laughs> off the street, um, various things. But what about domestic violence? What do you think we as a society, we as a community can do to try to help fight this problem and support its victims? Well, I first think for, first and foremost, and this is great what you're doing here right now, is communities have to own it as a problem. Mm -hmm. Because it's so easy for us to be very dismissive and says, oh, that doesn't happen to our friends, that doesn't happen, you know, in our community. And I think part of the problem is, is that we still, as communities, have to own that domestic violence exists. You know, there will still be debates about whether or not this is a private family manner. You know, right. you see that, all, you, you still see some of that conversations all the time. Um, the other thing that we have to do is be more preventive in terms of 
um, educating children. You know, we really have to educate children about healthy relationships. We in the DA's office got a little bit tired. I have to say, we got tired of like always prosecuting domestic violence cases, and we sat there like, what can we do? Hmm. So we developed a curriculum to go into um, schools or youth groups to talk to people, to talk to either adults or to even talk to children about what is a healthy relationship. And I think having conversations early on about what is healthy and what is not, it's so important. And some people think, well, you know, you should start in the high school. I think we have to start earlier than that about what's a healthy relationship. So, I mean, I think we have to put forth what our standards are, you know, when we're talking about that, you know, type of conversations, what's healthy, but we also have to have communities doing, like what you said, what you're doing right now, which is owning the problem by having the show and um, inviting people out to talk about, you know, domestic violence. Because I always say there's somebody in any audience that has been a victim and they're hearing what you're saying. Let's say someone knows someone else who they think uh, or they suspect is a victim of domestic violence and they come to you and they say what should I do how can I help w what's your answer so the first thing you shouldn't do is tell someone why don't you leave him he's a horrible person um, because that's judging a victim and that's assuming that this is such a straightforward situation uh, as we know domestic violence is very complicated and we talked a little bit about the many reasons why people would stay what you want to let a victim of domestic violence is someone who you suspect the victim is to let them know that they are not alone. Mm -hmm. You are there to help them. Um, statistics say that it takes like seven to eight times for a victim of domestic violence to leave their batterer. Um, so you don't know if this is the first time or the sixth time um, when that person is going to be ready to go. But what I would do is say, tell them they're not alone. Mm -hmm. I would maybe perhaps take them um, to a family justice center. You know, we talked about the family justice centers. They can call, um, New York City has a hotline number, 1-800-621-HOPE. You can also call 311 and say I need domestic violence information. And maybe you can find out um, where there are organizations that deal with domestic violence. So when they say they're ready for help, you can take them somewhere. But don't judge and let them know they're not by themselves. Great. I'm glad, glad you told us about that. Thank you. Anytime. Well, I think we could have gone on <laughs> longer because it's such an important issue and, and you're able to speak to us about it on so many different levels. Um, domestic violence, as, as we started to say at the beginning of the show, is a national problem. It's a local problem. It's an issue right here on the Upper East Side. And you talked about the importance of uh, developing awareness and shining a light on this problem. And I hope through this show, I hope we've had an opportunity, and I think we have, to, to, to do that. And I'm grateful to you for being on our show. And I want to thank you on behalf of Community Board 8 and the people we serve for the great work that you're doing and that your office is doing to fight this very serious and very challenging problem and coming up with all these new ways to deal with a very old problem and a problem that persists. Um, and I hope uh, we can support your efforts in any way we can by bringing awareness to it and recognizing, as you said, that it's an issue that affects all walks of life, regardless of socioeconomic background, regardless of neighborhood. So thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, thank you so much for having me.